Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm sure we'll have a few more people filter in, but um, let's get us started. Um, so first off, I am Sarah Brewer. I'm the director of our education program at Accords. Um, and I want to welcome you all to our seminar series today. This is um, Hot Topics in Mixed Methods. It's the final in our series for this uh, academic year. Um, so first off, what is Accords? Um, Accords is supported by the University of Colorado School of Medicine and Children's Hospital Colorado, and it's a unique one-stop shop for pragmatic research, um, for faculty con to conduct pragmatic research, to receive various types of services and support for grants and projects, um, along with incredible mentorship, training, and education in health services research. Um, Accords conducts pragmatic research in real world settings to improve healthcare and outcomes. We provide a multidisciplinary collaborative research environment to catalyze innovative and impactful research. Uh, we provide strong methodological cores and programs led by national experts, including this series, which uh, is partnered with our qualitative and mixed methods core. Um, we provide consultation and team building for proposals mentorship training and support for junior faculty, and extensive educational offerings, um, both locally and nationally, uh, of which this seminar series is one of our ongoing programmatic uh, offerings. Um, before I introduce our speaker today, um, I want to share uh, a couple of upcoming events uh, remaining for this year. So uh, the first is uh, part of our methods and challenges in conducting health equity research. Uh, and that series uh, is also wrapping up this month, May 15th. We have Dr. April O oh from the National Cancer Institute speaking on health equity in cancer prevention and control through implementation science. Uh, and then finally, we have COPPERCON or the Col Colorado Pragmatic Research and Health Conference, which is June 5th and 6th. Uh, and registration is open for that. We hope that you'll consider uh, joining us. I believe Jordan is uh, going to put the registration link in the chat. We have a really exciting lineup of speakers this year, so we hope uh, we will see many of you there. Now, before I introduce our speaker today and hand over our uh, webinar platform, uh, just a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, about our seminars and how we run them. So the first is please use our chat throughout the talk um, to share your questions, comments, um, and engage a little with the topic as we go through. We will have time for moderated question and answer at the end of the talk. So um, a little before the hour, we will stop and engage with the questions you've shared. And then second, at the end of the talk today, please complete our evaluation. Um, it helps us to provide the best seminars and educational offerings for uh, our local and national audiences. Okay, um, so today's seminar, uh, like I said, is part of our Hot Topics in Mixed Methods and Qualitative Research series um, and is the last of five talks in the series. Um, and today we welcome Dr. Jody Summers Holtrup. Um, Dr. Summers Holtrup is Professor and Vice Chair for Research at the University of Colorado Department of Family Medicine and a Senior Implementation Scientist in the Adult and Child Consortium for Health Outcomes Research and Delivery Sciences um, in the School of Medicine. She has extensive experience as an implementation scientist, qualitative and mixed methods researcher, health educator, and practice-based research director. She's participated in primary care research for over 20 years, which includes serving as principal investigator on National Institutes of Health, um, the Agency of Health Research and Quality, and foundation grants. Methodologically, she has expertise in the use of qualitative and mixed methods to inform research questions and is skilled in utilizing theoretical models as a lens in which one can understand how implementation works and to produce generalizable findings regarding the how, why, who, and what of interventions. Dr. Summers Holtrup has directed large studies with extensive qualitative components, incorporating both theoretical models as a guide, as well as grounded theoretical approaches, and is skilled in facilitating focus groups, in depth interviews, and cognitive task analysis interviews, analyzing qualitative data using uh, Atlas TI, and developing logic models and conducting analysis using qualitative comparative analysis. A large focus of her work has been studying the implementation of health promotion and chronic disease management in primary care, 
And finally, she is a master certified health education specialist with expertise in patient education and health behavior change, including motivational interviewing, which are applied to intervention development in programs and approaches in a variety of settings. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Summers Holtrip today as she presents, and then a miracle happens, getting into the complexity of mixed methods, designs, and approaches. Welcome, Jody. Thank you. Well, that was quite uh, quite the introduction there. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I'm just trying to get to the top screen. All right. Well, thank you for the opportunity to talk with you. Um, so we're going to kind of get into the black box a little bit and talk about mixed methods, designs, and approaches. Now, again, this is a very broad area with a whole lot of things we could talk about. So I'm going to try to find the right mix between covering a lot <laughs> um, uh, and giving kind of a sampling, but also a little bit of depth so you can get a better idea of what we're talking about. So by the end of the session, I hope that you will have the opportunity to learn about complex me mixed methods designs, key integration strategies, and advanced mixed methods approaches. So just to begin, when we talk about mixed methods, remember it's when a researcher collects and analyzes data that is both qualitative and quantitative and integrates the findings. So you're drawing inferences using both qualitative and quantitative approaches in a single study or program of inquiry. So you've probably seen this if you've had a presentation from me before, where there's multi-methods and mixed methods. So multi-methods uses more than one method, which can be qualitative and quantitative, but mixed methods uses both, but it involves integration so that the data is informing one another. And so that's why the pictures of the paint bucket, you know, the, the paint buckets with the, the colors is that it's not just doing something separately, it's integrating together. So that's kind of a hallmark of mixed methods. So why do this? Well, versus just the multi-methods, you can gain multiple perspectives to enhance the meaning of results, uh, really understand context better, get a more complex understanding of a problem, compare, validate, and triangulate results, examine processes and experiences with the outcome of a study, and to consider mixed methods for any study in which you are studying people in their own setting, not a controlled lab setting. As Sarah said, I am a dissemination and implementation researcher. We do a lot of research studying how things implement and disseminate in kind of quote real world settings. So it's really, really helpful to use mixed methods. Um, and using multi-methods is helpful, but mixed methods should get you a little bit further. So by way of introduction, this is a common question. How do you choose a mixed methods design? Um, so I'm gonna start there and talk about the different designs. And it really has to do with what is your research question, but it also has to do with practical considerations like how much time do you have? How much money and people and other resources do you have? What expertise do you have? And where are you in the exploration of your study topic? Like what is the next logical step for your program of research? So it's, it's okay to not use mixed methods. It's okay to use less methods. If that meets and right sizes your project in the practical ways, like, you know, if you have a very small budget and you don't have expertise, it's going to be hard to do a very complicated um, study with a lot of mixed methods because it, it just doesn't all fit together. So all of these things and more are important in choosing a design. So this is more of an advanced session than a basic session, but I wanted to start off with some basics so that we're all kind of on the same page. These are the three basic mixed methods study designs. I don't have them labeled, but the one on the top and the, the two on the left are sequential designs, which means that you do one part of data collection and analysis, and then the integration is the connection of that data to the next type of data collection and analysis. And then you can do a second step analysis to the right. So the circles are the 
connecting or integrating parts. And the, the squares or rectangles are more like the data collection and analysis parts. So you can see on the top left, one basic design is called an exploratory sequential design because you are exploring by doing qualitative first. And then that informs what you're gonna do quantitatively. And then you can connect the results of both at the end. The, the bottom left is the opposite, which is an explanatory sequential, which is you collect the quantitative information first, and then you, uh, then you connect it to qualitative and you interpret the results. And then the, the one on the right is where you do quantitative and qualitative somewhat similar time period. It doesn't have to be exactly but it's not a sequential design. You're doing each one separately, and then you look at the merged results. And that's so those circles are where the mixed methods kind of magic happens. That's where the integration happens, is those, those circles. Okay. So that's the basic. I'm just going to spend a very short amount of time on more complex. So usually complex designs involve something called scaffolding. There's my lovely clip art there of a scaffold. Um, but what you're trying to do is that you're either connecting lots of the basic designs, you're incorporating phases or time elements, or you're incorporating theories, models, or frameworks, and that's what makes them more complex. And so you start with the basic, but then you expand according to what your project is needing. So I'm going to show you a couple of pictures just to illustrate. I apologize, they're not lovely quality. <laughs> and that's just simply because I went on the internet looking for some, some pictures, and I decided to take pictures out of a workbook. But here's a couple of examples, and then I will show you some more from my own work in a little bit. But what you can see here with this example is there's two phases. So there's a phase one, which is first a qualitative study. And so you can see they're doing interviews and observation. The analysis is they're coding and doing thematic analysis. And then they have a result, and the result goes to, so this part of it is sequential, then it's going to an intermediate phase where they're developing an intervention. And then once they have the intervention, this is phase two, where you're doing quantitative data, but you also have some qualitative there, an intervention, and then you have observation and interviews again, then you have statistical analysis, coding, thematic, and then really that part looks like it's probably a convergent design uh, in the phase two, but you've really got kind of three things going on. You've got phases, you've got different qualitative and quantitative happening in the different phases, and then it informs the results overall at the end. So this one shows how there's some sequential and some convergent happening in one overall study. This is another one with a different format to it, where you've got a study phase, methods, and products. This is a format that I recommend for organizing when you're trying to plan out what you're doing. But in this particular example, there's a phase where they're doing qualitative, and then they're uh, analyzing that, taking those findings, developing a questionnaire, and then doing quantitative. So this one's similar in some ways to the last example, but they are, you can see how the methods fall out, you know, that middle column there at the bottom, see where it says integrated, integrate qual and quant findings. And so you can also see the products from each phase of everything that they're doing. So this is where it gets somewhat more complicated. And I will show you a diagram of a really complicated one um, that I did. But for now, that just gives you some ideas of how you can scaffold um, the basic designs, incorporate theory, and incorporate phases. All right. I know you're interested in integration, so let's talk about integration and my little graphic there is you're trying to take all these different threads and integrate them into one common message. So what is integration? It's where the qualitative and quantitative data come together and that it produces a synergy beyond what either one could do alone. And this is kind of the distinguishing cornerstone of mixed methods research. So you're trying to get to inferences beyond what either alone could generate. 
Mike Fetters, who's a, a friend and colleague who does a lot of mixed methods research. He's the editor for the Journal of Mixed Methods Research. And um, he always says one plus one equals three. So you try to get something more than one plus one equals two by doing the integration part. So what's in that black box? Well, I'm gonna talk a little bit about this, but again, this is a little bit like trying to explain how to be a qualitative researcher in an hour. <laughs> you can't really do it all, but I'm gonna give you some ideas and some hints of what happens in that black box of integration. All right, so one way you can think about integration is in how you collect your data. Now in those sequential designs that I showed you, the explanatory and the exploratory sequential designs, one data collection and analysis depends on another. And so you have some choices for integration related to sampling and how you're going to select your sample, how you're going to collect your data. And that is one part of integration. So you can see over here in this table, a workbook that I use in my class, which is called the Mixed Methods Workbook written by Mike Fetters. Um, this is a table from inside that workbook. And I recommend that workbook if you want to kind of work on your own and learning about doing mixed methods, because it's got a lot of um, open you know, worksheets that you can work through. But here's some ideas of integration types, building, connecting, exploring, comparing, constructing a case. These are all ways that you can utilize to inform the data collection. We can't get into a lot of details on all of these, but you can see how, like if you can select a connecting, it's that the results from one type of data collection are used to inform the selection of subjects for another type of data collection. So say, for example, you've done a survey and you have results and some of the survey respondents had very high results and some had low results. A connecting integration function is to say, oh, I'm going to intentionally pick out people who have high and low results from the survey to do the next step of our sequential design, which would be the qualitative work. And I'm gonna interview those people. So that's one way that you can do integration is to connect from one to another. The comparing strategy, and then those three under that are more of a kind of a convergent design where you collect information from qualitative and quantitative with the intent to compare them and you compare you can compare by matching, expanding, diffracting. So those are some choices there. Um, but you are intentionally thinking about who you are sampling and what you are collecting data on um, in your integration. The next slide here is integrated procedure. So this is the data analysis part. So there's the data collection part and there's the data analysis part. And so here are some integration types that you can use for the analysis part. Um, explaining, corroborating, enhancing, initiating, transferring, generalizing, transforming. So these are all analysis procedures that you can do with integration. And I'm going to work through some common examples. So in general, what you want to do in terms of steps is you're going to have the data that you're going to collect. You're going to frame your analysis with your study purpose. What you're trying to do a lot with mixed methods analysis is to discern patterns and try to see patterns in each type of data and together. You want to use organizational structures to summarize um, your initial findings. I'm going to talk about something called a joint display. And a joint display is something that you use at two different steps. One is while you're doing your analysis and one is for dissemination. They have the same name, but they can have two different purposes. And essentially what you're trying to do is look for inconsistencies, anomalies, anomalies, um, conflicting findings. You're trying to figure out what goes together and what doesn't. And so that's essentially setting you up for this integration procedure. So let's go through two very common integration procedures. One of the most common is an explanatory sequential design using what's called explaining integration. Okay, so you've got this table I just showed you. Um, explaining is one of the integration types. So uh, what you 
this is just a simplistic example. So for example, you do a quantitative data analysis and connect, collect, collect data collection and analysis, say you do a survey. And then one point of integration is, what do you need to know qualitatively to explain those quantitative results? Notice that sometimes I write quant and qual just to keep it short, but you would then an integration point is selecting the method and the sample for the qualitative work. You do the qualitative data collection and analysis, for example, interviews, and then you can do a second step integration procedure. What do the qual results say to explain the quant results? So here's a table, uh, a blank table, where you maybe you have a construct or a concept that you're looking to make sure you cover, and you do the quantitative, and you have that result. And then what is the integration that you're doing to connect one to the other? So I'm reading from left to right in this table, and then you have a qualitative result, and then you can do an integration at the end. So with a sequential design, you have two places that you can do this, and you do that for each construct. So for a hypothetical example, let's say that you survey practice members about their overall perception of integrated behavioral health and primary care. And across the practices, you get scores ranging from a mean of 3.3 to 5 on a 1 to 5 scale. Your integration could be to select practices with higher and lower scores and construct an interview guide to explore reasons why those perceptions, such as improvement in patient outcomes and accessibility, et cetera. So why were there differences by practice in how they answered that survey? You intentionally, so that's the integration there, you intentionally select out who you're going to sample. So that's kind of a data collection sampling integration. You conduct the interviews and you end up with themes around accessibility, stigma, team coordination. This is a hypothetical example, but say that's what you ended up with. You can also do integration again where practices with higher scores, here's a possible potential result, practices with higher scores on perceptions from the quantitative, also describe more positive experiences with on-site care team functioning, including psychologists and psychiatrists availability. So this is kind of how you're blending what you learn from the first phase and the second phase, it's not really phases, but the first part of quantitative and the second part of qualitative to come together and have some results at the end of it. So that's a really, really common thing that happens is that you do something quantitative, you intentionally do something qualitative based on what you learned quantitatively. If you do them both at the same time and one's not based on the other, it's just, it's fine. It's just not a sequential design. So with the sequential design, the intent is to connect the quant and qual phases so that the follow-up qual phase provides a strong explanation for the specific uh, results from the initial quant phase. It answers the question, what mechanisms explain the quant results and how do follow-up qual results illuminate the stats results or the, the quantitative or numbers results? A question is, do you do a second step analysis? Do you do that part at the end, that integration at the end? You can, and you can choose not to. Um, if it's the same sample, how does that work? Because the sample will influence both results. It's likely if that sample is the same, it'll be complementary or convergent. However, this is not always the case. Like sometimes when you ask your patient to fill out a PHQ-9 and they get a certain score, Score, and then you actually ask them, so how's your life going? And they tell you things that are very different <laughs> from what they actually put on their PHQ-9 questionnaire. So those things happen. And sometimes things come up qualitatively that weren't on the survey, or sometimes people interpret things differently. So sometimes you can end up with something different anyway. But the worthwhile part is when you want to drill down into the results and you want to use the qualitative to better understand the quantitative. How does it provide additional insight? So it's kind of a more like an expansion strategy. All right, so another most common integration uh, strategy is con the convergent design, and you're using a comparing type of integration. So you would do your quantitative data collection and analysis, like say you're going to abstract medical records about something, and then you do your qualitative data collection and analysis around you know the same time-ish, say you do observations and interviews, and then your integration is just looking at those results together 
do they agree or disagree? So some people use the terms agree and disagree, and some people use convergence and divergence. So they're, they kind of mean the same thing. But you can see in the blank table here, you're really trying to match up for each construct you have. How do the quantitative and the qualitative go together or not? So let's go through an example here. Say you identify medical records of patients who are receiving integrated behavioral health. So I'm trying to use a similar example. You categorize the billing diagnoses, intervention received, time noted for a visit, and you have a range of responses. And then you watch patients uh, get uh, integrated behavioral health care in practice, and you do a little maybe mini interview with them and ask them about the same things. What was the reason for your visit? What services did you get? Time, you know, how much time did it take? And you get a range of responses there. And so your integration is matching up that medical record results to what you observed. Do they show the same thing? And then you can get to answers. This is, again, a hypothetical answer that maybe patients with insurance and English language skills had a better concordance of their experience, meaning they their, their quantitative and their qualitative matched up better than other patients. Uh, I don't know if that's actually ever true, but I'm just saying that would be an example of something you could find. So with this hypothetical example, um, here's a little bit more filled out in detail. Say the theme or the construct is construct is accessibility. So this is a little bit more expanded table. If accessibility is a key feature that you would like to explore, a quote from your qualitative interview could be, I would have not have gotten help from a psychiatrist. The wait to have help is so long and I would not even know where to start, which supports the theme of this patient would have gotten you know, access only in this way. The survey results of all the patients who were asked a question, the question being, having behavioral health care as part of primary care doctor's office makes it easier for patients or people to get access to this type of care. There's a 4.7 on a five point scale there, um, meaning that a lot of people agree with that. So the interpretation of looking at these together is there's strong concordance that the patient interview stories described consistent results with their survey findings about access. And so this is just one construct, but you could repeat this throughout all the constructs that you're looking at in your study and see to which extent they agree or don't. So the convergent design, the intent is to develop results and interpretations that expand understanding are comprehensive and are validated and confirmed. So it answers the question, to what extent do the qual and quant data converge or diverge? So it's important to know that you're going to have different types of fit. So concordance is when the qual and quant results confirm each other. Expansion is when they expand. They have some overlap, but one kind of expands the other. So there's some the same, some that are have a little more on either kind of quote side. They're complementary. They complement each other, but they're different. Or discordance is where the findings conflict or contradict. And so you could find all of these things in your one study for different constructs. But what do you do if your results are disconfirming? Meaning that, um, like in that table I just showed you, what if the patient interview results said very different things than what the um, survey results said? Then you have to go back and decide, hmm, what do I want to do? So you have some choices where you can cite trust in one method more than the other and then state that as a limitation. You can collect additional data to try to help resolve the discrepancy. You can re-examine the existing databases to try to resolve the discrepancy. You can try to turn to theory for an explanation or you can do another study. And there's probably more choices, but these are the main ones. So it's it's common that this happens. And sometimes you just report it like, you know, here's here's how they're different. They don't go together. Um, and that's OK. And you just want to be able to be able to explain it. I'm just going to pause for a second and say it's really important when you do mixed methods work to keep organized. You want to understand kind of, you know, keep your eye on the ball because things get really messy. You're trying to do data collection and analysis for lots of different methods, especially if it's a very complicated study. So you wanna make sure that you don't uh, let 
things kind of spiral out of hand and keep it all organized. So I'm just going to recommend that you consider writing out the steps one by one of each thing that you're going to do, how you're going to do each step, and then the product that you're expecting from each step. Remember the second diagram I showed you on more of the scaffold, scaffolded designs um, from the workbook that I took the picture of? Um, it That one had it, uh, columns to it where you could see where each procedure, each uh, part of what you were doing had a procedure and a product with it. So I'll show you another example of what that looks like in a minute. So some key things about integration. I didn't completely open up the black box, but hopefully that gave you, those examples gave you some ideas. Keep in mind, it's a lot like qualitative analysis. Your brain is the analysis machine. It's not like you put data into SPSS and it spits out an answer. It's like you need to look at your data and say, is this alike? Is this different? Is it you know, doing this? Is it doing that? So that's really the magic of the integration is looking at your data and considering it very thoughtfully and letting the data teach you what it, it's saying. Name a method and what you are seeking. Are you trying to complement, agree, expand? Or when you read your data, what is it saying to you? Have a team to do this. We do a lot of triangulation across the team where there's three people on the team. One person gets the data and looks at it and says, this is what I think the data is saying. The other person does the same thing and the other person does the same thing. And you compare and have discussion. And that helps keep you honest to your data. Use organizational diagrams and figures to keep it clear, both at the organization and the analysis stages and for presentation. And I'll show you some joint displays in a minute, but start by comparing constructs one by one, then build the cases for an overall theme across all the results. A lot of the time I say to people, you're kind of looking at the forest and you're looking at the trees. The trees are like the constructs you're trying to understand, and the forest is all the constructs together. What is your stay, study saying overall? How did each tree add up to being part of that forest? And then look in the literature, talk with other informants who are doing the work, keep yourself and your team real about what the true differences are and what are variations on the same, and be creative. Um, that's why it's really great to have all these choices to do mixed methods because you can be creative. I'm going to talk for a minute about joint displays. Joint displays are often considered an advanced mixed methods integration technique. It can be pretty basic or it can be advanced, but I'm just mentioning it here that it is both a method of analysis and a way to display results. So a very basic example, Shell would say for each construct, you have a quantitative result, a qualitative result, and an interpretation. But I'm gonna show you, these are a couple of examples I found from the literature. If you're in my class or have taken my class, you've probably seen these before. This, this is also in the mixed methods workbook. But I just think it's helpful to look at what other people have done. I'm only going to show you a few. But over here, what it has, this is a study where they looked at clinical trial expert opinions on ethical advantages to adaptive clinical trials. The topic does not matter. But what's interesting is over on the left, they did some kind of quantitative study where they have confidence intervals and ranges for different people responding. Let's say it's to a survey. So they've got that over on the left and then cold color coded are key summary items from the qualitative results. So the green has to do with the consult biostatistician. So you can see their responses. And then you can also see some narrative about uh, the summary. So you can see how they go together or they don't. Why is it that the green is so much higher than the blue? Why did the biostatistician answer so differently than the academic biostatistician, which is the blue. Um, and so you can see that all in one place. So that's one example of a format of how you can put your results together. This is more of a display of results than an analysis diagram. Here's another one that was from an explanatory sequential design. 
using a theoretical framework. So this study was looking at this something called the work relationship scale or WRS. And so what they did was they did this uh, scale um, and gave it to various people. And then the constructs are the rich communication, the heedful interrelating trust. So those are the bolded items. And then right under that is the explanation of that construct. But then what they did was they took low clinics with low scores and clinics with high scores. And then they put a quote in there that represented what that meant. So you can see how on the concept of rich communication, clinics with low scores looked different than clinics with high scores. Um, and this is a very common, it's a kind of like a positive deviance approach, but it's a common approach where you're really trying to understand the range of something. So that's another example of a display. I'm going to go through some really complicated displays from some work that I've done. Don't try to understand every part because they're they're kind of complicated. The first one is I had done a lot of research on care management. We were trying to understand why does care management work really well sometimes and why does it not work really well sometimes? So this was a very implementation study. And this is a very different type of analysis that we were trying to do. We're using a concept called macrocognition. Let me explain what these are. These are tables from that paper. The top table, what we did, um, and this does not look like my basic shells. So this is why I'm saying this is where it gets a lot more complicated. We were using re-aim as our model for outcomes. We had five practices. So you can see over there on the left table, five, A, B, C, D, and E. And we rated each practice on reach, effectiveness, adoption, implementation, maintenance, and then we ranked them on how well they did overall on re-aim. So you, this is kind of like an outcomes table. So practice A had 290 patients per FTE that went through care management. So that was their like patient reach. They all had good effectiveness. The adoption was how many providers were referring to the care manager. The implementation was a qualitative rating. So we kind of grouped how well they did with their implementation and the maintenance was how well they followed up with patients. So practice A was the number one and practice E was the number five. So that's the top table, but the bottom table was, we were trying to say, well, why is one different than five? Like, why are these practices different in their outcomes here for, from re-aim? So we ranked the practices, this is table six at the bottom, A through E, and we said, okay, A is the best one, and E is kind of not the best one on our outcomes. How does that correspond to macrocognitive functions? So to what extent were each of them using coordinating, planning, decision-making, et cetera? And so we rated them. The plus plus is they used it well and often, and a minus was not, using, not used or not used well. And so what we can see here is it illustrates a relationship that the practices that didn't do as well, like practice E, also were not using these functions and processes in implementing their care management. So that kind of opens the black box a little bit of like what's going on with care management. This is a different example on a different topic. It's telemedicine implementation. To be fair, this is just qualitative. It's not really a mixed methods result, but the reason why I put it in here is I wanted to show how we were trying to illustrate concordance and discordance across different interview types. So we interviewed patients, providers, clinical staff, administrators, and practices, and then we compared to what extent do all do they all say the same thing or say something different? And so this is the table from that paper where we looked at how like how did they talk about reaching patients with telemedicine? Did they say the same things or different things? And so we just kind of listed out in a table how they talked about whether it was the same or different across these different groups. So again, I'm just kind of trying to show you a table from a paper so you can get some ideas. This is the really complicated one. I'm gonna go through it pretty fast because we don't have a lot of time left, but um, this was also a care management study. And this was published with Mike Fetters in the Journal of Mixed Methods Research. This is our qualitative data collection 
only. So I'm just trying to give you a sense of what you might want to put in your conceptual diagrams to map out what you're doing as a process. And then this was our outcomes table of all the different mixed methods processes that we used. I'm not going to go through all of this in depth, but you can see the structure that on the left, this was the data collection. Then we had the analysis, the processes that we used, analysis, and then the products that we got. And so there was qualitative, quantitative, and mixed methods analysis happening here. One of the main things here in the middle, kind of to the right, is we did something called a qualitative comparative analysis, which I'm going to go through here in a second, um, as kind of our main mixed methods analysis. But this is what a complex design um, could can look like. I'm going to skip over that one due to time. Advanced mixed methods approaches. So in the remaining uh, about five to eight minutes, I'm going to kind of fly through some um, approaches that can be used for advanced mixed methods, qualitizing and quantitizing, configurational comparative methods, and social network analysis are three that I just picked out that I think are pretty cool. The first one is quantitizing. You've already probably done this. It's essentially converting qualitative data to quantitative data. And sometimes you want to do this. This is in some ways considered mixed methods because you are doing data transformation. You are, you are taking one kind of data and turning it into another type of data. How do you do this? You're gonna convert your qualitative data into numbers or groups and analyze, you can analyze it with other quantitative data. So you do need to be careful about some things with this. Small sample sizes can be a problem. Volunteered information is not necessarily representative because you didn't ask everybody. You're squishing down your data in the way that you could lose meaning. And you're putting qualitative data into a quantitative paradigm, which is not always a great thing to do. But here um, are some examples of things you might that that might look like. So maybe you have themes and you look at the frequency of the themes or number of units, or you categorize things into groups. You might do a qualitative analysis looking at that second to last bullet point. You're looking at uh, a document review for your qualitative work and you want to note the number of times a statement appears or the time elapses before a unit of analysis is observed. So these are all kind of quantitizing. The other is qualitizing. So you're taking quantitative data and turning it into qualitative data. Um, and I think a lot of us do this inherently by summarizing quantitative data. The difference is you are doing it a little bit more explicitly. So essentially what you're trying to do is look at quantitative results and then describe them qualitatively and develop themes uh, around that. And so you do need to be really very careful with this, that quantitative data only gives you so much and you wanna be careful to not make inappropriate leaps and make judgments about what that quantitative data is saying without um, you know, some other substantiation. It can be hard to do and you want to be careful. Um, I think what I'd like to say about these two techniques though, is that, um, and here's some examples of uh, qualitizing, is I like this as an and rather than a only. So do your qualitative data analysis, then consider doing something extra with it where you're quantitizing. Do your quantitative analysis. And if you want to try to summarize or represent themes, you can and do it but you want to not skip over and just do this. All right, I'm gonna go very quickly through configurational comparative methods. So um, CCMs are a family of methods that allow you to consider program features and contextual conditions to examine relationships in groups or sets with outcomes. The main thing is it's not statistics. It does not have assumptions of normality or linear relationships. And it does work for smaller uh, sample sizes. It is based on qualitative information first in most cases. So it is a form of quantizing. You're moving from variables to conditions 
you are looking, it's like they are case-based approaches and you're looking at groups of cases with and without outcome conditions. The thing that works really, really well for this is that it allows for equifinality. There are multiple paths to a good outcome. So what, what you do with CCM, and I'm gonna talk this through really quickly, but is that you have to have an outcome with a variable result if either, you know, kind of yes or no results. And then you're looking for necessary conditions and sufficiency conditions. Necessary conditions are those that must be present to produce in a good outcome. And sufficient conditions are those alone in combination will always result in a good outcome, but they're not necessary. And this is really, really helpful for implementation and dissemination research, because we're trying to figure out like what has to be there to make this work. And what are, it works in this situation in this way, and it works in this situation in this other way. So there are two main methods within CCMs, coincidence analysis and qualitative comparative analysis. I have only used QCA. I think CNA is really useful. Um, they are very similar, but there's a lot of debate about which one is better. And so if you're interested, you can explore this further. CNA is more difficult to learn. So essentially what you're doing is determining what outcome you want, what conditions might impact the outcome, and you're gonna collect data and organize it into a table and conduct the analysis. So here is a study we did with registry implementation. And I just have a few more minutes, so I'm going to go through this and social network analysis quickly. But um, so with this one, we were trying to understand what were the conditions that set up for a practice to implement a registry successfully. So the first step is you create your conditions, define them, and then you calibrate them from one to zero. So this is a table in that paper where we did that. Then what you do is you give each condition for each unit. So over there on the left are the cases. You give it a score from zero to one. And so then you use over there on the right is the outcome of registry success. Then you put all of this into a program and it gives you equations that tell you what combination of conditions go with, see that consistency score kind of in the middle there? That tells you to what extent this combination of conditions go with a positive outcome. So in this case, practices one, two, three, five, six, eight, nine, 50% of them, if they were a health system, if they had a key person, resources and leadership, they were able to implement the registry. Other health system practices, if they had a QI mindset, resources and leadership were able to implement. And if they were not a health system practice, both key person, QI mindset and resources and leadership were important. So what you can see from this is resources and leadership were important all the time. And then this QI mindset and key person were also important in different uh, you know, scenarios. Social network analysis is the last one I'm going to talk about. It's an analytic method to examine networks and their communication and workflow patterns. And uh, it is considered a mixed method because if you use qualitative information first to get the quantitative, then it's a way to see your data differently. I am really running short on time. I'm sorry this is taking too long, but what I'm going to do is just kind of show you, this is another study, so I'm going to cut to the chase really quickly. Um, we were looking at where a care manager was located in the practice, and the result of our analysis, you get really cool diagrams like this, and essentially what this is saying is that over here on the right, the green diamond shape, the care manager is in the middle of uh, the importance to communication around chronic disease management. This was an embedded care manager. Over on the left, the care manager that was external to the practice was just really not uh, important. They weren't being utilized um, because people, they weren't there. Um, and so that's a really important mixed methods finding. And then you get some really interesting statistics. Uh, 
SNA statistics on um, things like density and centralization and those kinds of things that are really helpful. And so this is a really cool method. So um, these advanced methods often develop, you often gather the data qualitatively and then you convert it to quantitative and then you can analyze it in a lot of different ways. So in summary, mixed methods involves qualitative and quantitative data collection and integration. By doing it, you can get more insight than just doing them each individually. I recommend that you use diagrams, figures, tables, organizational structures to help you do your mixed methods analysis and that there's lots of them that you can choose from. Also just gonna mention if you wanna in-depth training, there are two different courses that about half the class is on doing mixed methods. These are the two classes offered in our clinical studies graduate program. All right, so I'm gonna escape and stop sharing. <laughs> I was meaning to give you more time, but there we go, questions. Okay. Thank you so much, Jody. Um, we do have a question about um, sort of new directions in mixed methods. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and read it. Uh, it's from Dr. Kokai. Uh, are there new directions in advanced mixed methods analysis that really excite you as an educator? Um, well, I went through some of them that are my favorites, QCA and CNA, I use a lot and they're being used a lot more. I think a lot of it is just knowing that there's a lot of different methods you can choose and picking the one that works, one or ones that pick that work for your study. So um, I don't know if I can answer that question better. I mean, some of the is like our team is doing a lot more with we're exploring something called concept mapping, where you interview people and you use a program to diagram out how they think about it. And it creates these really nice visual diagrams of conceptual maps. And then what you do is you create up a map for everybody and then you compare across all the maps like the degree of density of their conceptual knowledge, the degree of interconnectedness and, um, you know, how they're thinking about the concepts. So to me, that gets into more depth of understanding, like what's going on about something. So those are some places that I'm going to um, try to understand better. Yeah. Judy, I'm wondering if you could talk for a minute about um, the sort of early phases of thinking about uh, an advanced mixed methods design and how you think about that balance you talked about between your resources and your, <laughs> your time available um, and how complex to get to answer your questions. How do you approach uh, balancing those when you're, when you're trying to answer some of these complex questions with complex designs? Great question, difficult to answer. Um, I would consider asking the Accords team to help consult with you on what you know how complicated. Um, if you're doing quantitative and qualitative anyway, then it's not like a huge lift to actually integrate them, right? It does take some intentional thought up front. To do some of the more complicated methods, though, you really need the expertise. You're going to need a consultant. Like if you're going to do social, I don't do all these things on my own. I do them with other people. Like that's why I have these papers is I work with people who have training and social network analysis and they help me to do it. Um, so I think do you have the, the money and time? There's participant burden too. So, you know, to do the extra step of the mixed methods. And what I'm gonna say is it's okay if you don't, don't try to stress yourself out and do something that you don't know how to do and you, you know, but I'd also be willing to try it and um, try to get a consultant to work with you and help you. But, um, this is why Accords offers consultation is to say, here are all the, like you can, people meet with me and I say, here's all the choices. Like, let's see what fits. It's like pulling the right golf club out of your golf bag. I'm not a golfer. So that's maybe a bad analogy, but you know, you don't use a, you don't use a driver to hit a putt, right? Right. Uh, yeah. You know, <laughs> you use a, a putting wedge, right. Or something, you know, so you want to kind of 
fit the right methods to what you're trying to do, um, but to tell you what is the right thing to do in all circumstances is very hard. Well, Jenny, I want to say thank you for a really wonderful and dense talk. Um, <laughs> you covered a lot of ground very nicely, and I hope um, others who are here with us today are taking away some nuggets that will be applicable to their work. Um, so thank you very much thank for, you. for still here. Um, Jordan has just put our evaluation link in the chat. Please uh, fill that out and let us know uh, how this talk was for you today. Thank you thank all you. so much. Have a wonderful afternoon. Do you want me to stay?